And a very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Issues and Attitudes. My name is Jeff Owens, Interim Director at WEIU. My co-host is Alicia Haynes. Hi, everyone. And we have a bunch of folks from the Booth Library in uh, in the area, or in the, in the studio. <laughs> Reference Library, <laughs> Stacy Knight Davis. I'll make hey. sure I got all those names in there. <laughs> I'm making a rep- repeat appearance, David Bell. Hello. And brand new to the community as of August 1st, Mr. Zach Newell, Dean of Library Services. Hello. Great to be here. Appreciate it, Zach. And since you are brand new, I thought we would welcome you and start with you a little bit. Sure. I guess the the question we ask everyone who's brand new to Eastern, you know, what do you think about Eastern so far and also what led you to uh, EIU? Well, I love Eastern so far. Really happy to be here. Uh, Great faculty, great staff, and a lot of optimism across campus. And I came here from Salem, Massachusetts, and I was at a state school and uh, a lot of similarities initially. And uh, things are really taking off now that I'm here. Did you did you know you want to move back to the Midwest or move to the Midwest or just one of those things that came up? Well, it was uh, something that came up and it was a great opportunity. And of course, after coming here, I I think uh, they did the rest in, in selling me on it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to the community, and we'll, and we'll get back to some more of you later. But again, from everybody at WEIU, we welcome you and hope to have a new friendship. We've always had a great rapport with the library over there. Thanks. With you, with previous managers and, and Beth and everybody. But let's talk about this exhibit that's going ready to uh, or is it opened up i'm sorry yeah yeah, we just opened last thursday last thursday so So let's talk about it and what's going on at the uh, library right now okay well um we just had our opening and we're working on getting the uh, video from uh, dr sheila simons's presentation posted uh she gave a a very dynamic and uh instructive introduction to uh, the 1918 pandemic and uh, i think david has some uh, information here on uh, what all happened during the pandemic just to give people some background from 100 Um, years ago sure part of the uh exhibit is about what happened in 1918 and then it also goes into the present and uh, how we deal with flu today uh, but just some statistics that I that are in the exhibit that I brought with me um, in 1918 this was a, a really um, unusual uh, a version of the uh, the flu virus that had evolved and um, was highly infectious it infected one-third of the world population um, and it killed uh, worldwide, uh, at least 50 million people. Now, I want to stop there because when I read that this morning, I was like, that has to be a typo, but then I read 50 million people. 50 million. That's incredible. Yeah, 675,000 in the United States. So a lot of the 50 million were in other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other unusual thing about it was, uh, rather the terrifying thing about it was, it didn't. Uh, Usually, uh, infectious disease like this kills uh, or uh, has the, the greatest impact on weak or uh, comprom- people with compromised immune systems. So, um, you know, elderly people and children are the most uh, vulnerable. But uh, this particular virus um, uh, affected people in the prime of their life, like age 20 to 40. Do they have any um, idea, like, the origination or why or, you know, when you... Yeah, they, uh, they actually did a, a recombinant project with some samples that were still surviving from 1918 and uh, rebuilt the genome of that virus and uh, found that it had uh, come from an initial bird source, so it was an H1N1 virus. Wow. Um, one of the exhibits that we have out in the, the far north lobby of the building gives some more information on how, about how the viruses jump from birds to people or birds to pigs to people or birds to ferrets to, you know, and there, there's all kinds of intermediate animal car- uh, carriers with the flu and Dr. Simons covered quite a bit of that in her presentation as well but uh, tends to start in waterfowl then jumps to domestic birds then jumps to either pigs or people and then keeps going from there. So, so. Was, was there a certain I guess area or part of the world where it started? That is unknown because it was so long ago. Um, Dr. Simons mentioned that patient zero was I believe in Kansas. Is that correct David? Yeah, yeah. that's that was uh, what what she uh, told us and it was known at the time as the Spanish influenza or Spanish flu which was kind of a misnomer Um, but the reason it got that name uh, at least that that's what the historians uh, seem to agree is that um, because of World War one was also going on Mm -hmm. at the time and Spain was not involved in the war and all the countries that were involved in the war were trying to downplay the fact that they had so many sick people because they're trying to to win the war um so it was in the u.s and germany and other places um but uh it was reported a lot in the press in spain 
and so that's kind of how the world found out about it at first. Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of hidden from the media. Is that mm -hmm. It kind of was, yeah. Because um, the, the other thing, the significant thing about this event was that it happened in the middle of a world war, too, and uh, actually killed more people um, than the war. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, more Americans than the war. I'm not sure about worldwide. We were so Pretty close, confined, yeah. too, in the trenches and whatnot. I would, mm -hmm. I would assume that that would be the case. That's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. 50 million people. Yeah, let's talk about the media a little bit and, and how the media covered this. And, and as, as you guys have done your research and maybe some of the exhibitors, uh, talk about the media from back then and, and what were they saying in the, in the newspapers, pre-TV, obviously. <laughs> um. David, you, they're yeah. all looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the way it was reported in the newspapers was it varied um, a lot. And I have some examples from local papers in our exhibit. Um, there's, a, there's a, the Daily Alert guy was, uh, was uh, in publication at the time. I think the Daily Eastern News uh, what had only been around for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think they started in 1916 or yeah, something like that. They were doing a weekly issue um, at that point, and there are um, two mentions of the flu, and we have both of those printed out large and in one of the cases cool. in the in the uh, north end of the building. Um, but they, they did have reports. The thing about the press coverage was the, the, uh, the war dominated it. Yeah. And so all the top headlines were about what was happening in the war. And then you, you might see um, below the fold an article like, you know, 600 uh, hospitalized today or 50 something. 50 million people the died. Flu. That's yeah. the second story. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, did, any, did any of the stories that you researched or anything that you found out, I mean, were people panicking back in 1918? Or, or what, what was the kind of the feel of the country? Is, is that kind of broached in the, uh, in, in the exhibit at all? Well, um, Dr. Simons touched on this pretty well during her presentation, and it kind of it varied from area to area. Uh, some towns, the entire town would be quarantined to where even uh, the firefighters and police weren't doing too much. Uh, the, the thing is that they weren't really sure what was causing it or how to prevent it. There were some people thought it was maybe sewer gas. Um, there were quite a few um, preachers that were pushing the idea that it was punishment from God. You know, they never really did figure out exactly what was causing it. So there would be um, e either quarantines put in or public health notices about don't spitting, use a handkerchief, cough etiquette, that sort of thing. But they really had not much to go on. Um, towards the, the end of the epidemic, they did figure out the, the, the gauze mask, which we've got featured in our logo and on our uh, flyer both. And that, of course, helped contain things because it helped some of the airborne particles get stopped. But those things are so hot, I don't know how anyone That's wore good. them. Now, Zach, when you uh, see that the library is doing something like this, and they probably did a lot of work before you got here, I mean, how, how, how proud of you are of what you, the staff you kind of have acquired and, and, and going forward when you think about an exhibit like this at that booth? I'm very proud. I think it's fantastic that they're doing this kind of work. I mean, I mean, honestly, it's great visibility for the campus, for the community, and, and it's a great opportunity to collaborate and showcase the Booth Library as a source or fulcrum for interdisciplinary collaborations and, and, and interdisciplinary inroads. And it's a great way to share research and, and information and, and show that the Booth Library is a hub and interested in moving forward with exploring this kind of information. Let's talk about the exhibit. If you could go through some of the things that are going to happen over Booth, kind of the, sure. the when, the where, the hot, why. I know there's events coming on for mm -hmm. about the next, uh, what, six, seven weeks. Well, our next one coming up is on October 1st at 4 p.m. And that is uh, Ramona Tomshack from uh, Sarah Bush Lincoln uh, Medical Center or Health Center. Sorry, Health Center. Yeah. Health Center. It, it's right here on the page. I just can't read. Um, <laughs> she's she's the infection control preventionist out at Sarah Bush, and she's going to be talking to us about the different things that happen within a healthcare setting to try to keep infections from spreading. Uh, and the title of her presentation is Influenza and Infection Prevention. Can you say? flu, SARS, MERS, and CoV. So she's going to be covering a lot of the different infectious agents and, and how her work helps keep all of us healthy when we have to go to the hospital when there's an infectious disease outbreak. 
Um, after that, on October 9th and 11th, uh, the cafe over in Clem Hall is going to be doing a 1918 menu. I saw this. So what, do you know what's on it? Can I um, <laughs> I've not heard a whole lot yet from Dr. Wilkinson. The general idea he gave us was he was going to play off the whole white food movement from that time period where you were supposed to eat things that were very bland and colorless for your health. Um, there you go. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we do have the menu from the 1918 banquet that was held at Eastern, and it was, uh, I think it was a veal cutlet. Um, potatoes and bread. Potatoes, <laughs> some sort of aspect. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly the what the menu will be yet, but it will be um, very much themed around that white food idea was the last thing <laughs> I heard. Who cares for tomatoes, him. folks? You, you know, as a side <laughs> note, to root this in, in 1918, 1917 thereabouts is the library is named after Mary Booth, who was the director of the library from 1904 to 1945. But David had done a little sleuthing and discovered in the archives the 1918 yearbook book in which it showed a picture of Mary Booth going heading to World War One uh, she was bringing books did I did I get that correctly uh, she volunteered for the Red Cross okay and Mary Booth was the librarian at Eastern from 1904 and then up till the war she uh, at that time she volunteered to go overseas to help with the war effort and um, yeah, she was, I think it was a joint effort between the American Library Association and the Red Cross. Red Cross, yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, so she she went over there, and they had a, uh, a going away party for her, um, and uh, there's, a, uh, there's a fun account of that in the 1918 uh, senior scrapbook. Yeah. And apparently they, um, they, someone wrote a song for her, and they all sang it. Mary Booth, Mary Booth, something. I don't remember how it went. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so cool. Um, and uh, they also, uh, they, they did, uh, uh, someone put together a play, um, like a, a charades version of a library science class. One of the students impersonated Miss Booth, <laughs> and they, uh, they simulated checking out books and and uh, <laughs> things like that. I mean, we, and she'd only started 14, so she must have had a gigantic impact immediately on this mm -hmm. campus. Then. She did. Well, her, her big thing in her whole career was to get a, a, a standalone library building for this university, for this campus, um, because, of course, everything was in Old Main when it first started, and the library was like two or three rooms of, in Old Main, and uh, it quickly outgrew that space. So... Um, yeah, and she came back after the war, and she um, w retired in 1944, I think. 44, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, yeah. So she literally was here her whole Both life. world wars. She was, right. Yeah, yeah. right, right. And wow. she came back in the, with the picture you had, she came back in 1950 for the dedication of the library. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the library building we have now, it's originally opened in 1950, and she came back for the dedication. She lives here in Charleston. There's a little house over on 4th Street, uh, Booth House. That was, yeah. that was her house. Um, and uh, she died in 1965. Wow. <laughs> So we, uh, that, that was a good segment to go off. And any other thing? I mean, I know there's lots of stuff. You know, right, let's go, can we go to the exhibit a little bit, just so you know sure, what people sure. can expect? Uh, you know, that you talked about the mask and stuff. Yeah. Kind of um, so we through. we've got several different cases going. I did quite a few of them, so I'll I'll rattle on for a bit here about <laughs> okay. what I did. Uh, the one in the north, as I mentioned, it it talks about some of the ways animals transfer the flu between each other into humans. Also covers uh, some basic steps to take to prevent the spread of flu. And um, it also goes a little bit into livestock health because trying to keep chickens separated from wild birds is a key thing with uh, preventing the flu from jumping. Okay. Um, I'll let David talk for a second here about the case that's across from the one there in the north end. Uh, so that's in the, in the north foyer. The other exhibit case is um, what I put together, which is how people uh, dealt with the flu in 1918 and, and the events that happened. and. Uh, there's a panel on the statistics, some, some of the things I talked about, how many people were infected and how many died. Um, and the, there's a panel about the masks and uh, how those were pretty ubiquitous. Pretty much everyone wore those. And uh, um, there's, uh, uh, what else? Um, 
I got a question while you're, yeah. while you're in thought there, Dave. Sure. Mm -hmm. When did they know that the pandemic of 1918 was, when, when it was over, when did they, just the dates and how do they know? Well, um, from what Dr. Simons told us, basically they just ran out of people that could still be infected. So it just kind of trailed off as people that had not been infected ceased to exist. So, so it almost through, hit like a certain segment of population and not others? Is well, it, it hit everybody, but either you had it and died or you had it and lived. It's and like once the walking you, dead in real you life had it, you couldn't yeah. get it <laughs> really? again. So, yeah, I mean, it, it very much was. And uh, Dr. Simons compared it to the Black Plague, and it, it's nothing. The plague was nothing compared to what the flu was. Oh, so Really? Yeah. I'm going to wash my oh hands my gosh. every three minutes now. Yeah, and, and, you know and working off of that, we do have an example example of uh, how to properly wash your hands on one of the bulletin boards. Most people yeah. don't do it right. Um, there's a, a snippet from a research article in there from uh, a couple decades ago where they proved what portions of the hand do not get washed. Uh, so w we've got that. Um, and, that, and that was a large <laughs> theme from doc, Dr. Sh uh, Sheila Simons, too, yeah. about this shaking of hands. I mean, think about how many hands you shake in the course of a day. Yeah, all three years. Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. What portions are those? It's usually the, the back of your hand along your thumb between your fingers oh, I can because see that. no one ever runs the fingers together. Under the nail beds is another yeah, commonly I missed see place. That too. So, you know, if you think you kind of rub them together like this, this always gets That's missed. So, you know, it's sorry for the people on the on no, the radio that aren't on TV. Right there, yeah, it's TV. Uh, <laughs> you know when you rub your hands together, if you do it like you normally would, and then think about all the places you're missing. Um, you're supposed to sing happy birthday twice in your head while you're That's what your my hands. mother told us yeah. to do. Yeah, so I still do. I feel like a child when I go in there. But uh, this is a college campus. This is a very dirty place, okay? <laughs> so I am going to wash yeah, my hands. And that's one of the, the kind of scary things that's covered in the exhibit in the, the far north lobby is the flu virus particles can survive up to 48 hours on a surface. So, oh And they can also get transferred around through air systems. So if somebody has a good sneeze, it goes up into the air handler, the whole building is now breathing. And that's why you're never supposed to use those air handlers in the bathroom, yeah, right? Yeah, it blows it everywhere. Yeah. See, so I don't know why people invented uh, those. See, I'm, yeah. I'm No one realizes that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, How you, you, you hanging in, in there? <laughs> <laughs> don't breathe too close, uh, closely yeah, into the mic. Uh, other stuff. This is really fascinating. Yeah. So, um, in addition, uh, Brad Tolpanen, who um, has, uh, he'll be coming back as our head of circulation here later this week, he pulled a bunch of historical um, public health posters from the era, so things about, you know, spit equals death, uh, <laughs> how to, to cough into your handkerchief, that sort of thing, and those are all behind the security desk, as well as a, uh, a mock-up of one of the gauze masks we've got in there for people to look at. Um, discovered when I was trying to make that mask that the style of gauze they used back then isn't really in production anymore. So we kind of had to fake it up with a few odds and ends of old stock that health services had and, you know, some other things I had around my house. So, I mean, even just the gauze technology has changed significantly in 100 so, years. No, I was in Sally Renault's class when she did, we had a research project and we mm -hmm. researched um, the flu that the pandemic and my part of the research project was studying advertisements so two questions from that in those advertisements i saw things like you know the special tonic if you put it if you drink it you'll you'll you know avoid getting the flu um or if you shave your head there, that was one of them mm -hmm. too you'll avoid getting the flu um so my question is when did the flu shot when did they stop doing all this make-believe tonic stuff, and when did they come up with, with the flu shot? That is a great question, and I don't remember the exact date, but I want to say it was right after World War II is when they first started perfecting it. Does that sound right, David? That's, I'm, I'm not sure either. Okay. But, uh, it, it, I think but, I've heard um, that as well. I know. <laughs> at the after. time, right. in, in 1918, they did know about bacteria, and they there were some... Uh, uh, vaccines for things, but they yeah. didn't exactly know what the cause of it right. they was. They just sort of attempted to make out. a vaccine, but it wasn't yeah. for the right thing, they, so it was completely useless they, uh, at the time. They vaccinated for smallpox back then, but yeah. they didn't know exactly. They just like took some stuff from mm -hmm. uh, infected. Uh, uh, wound from the smallpox <laughs> and and uh they were actually doing that back in the middle ages right um but they Which didn't know the science behind it 
and uh, the flu virus, they didn't really, at the time, in 1918, they didn't have uh, a microscope that could see it. It couldn't be seen until mm -hmm. the electron microscope was developed, like in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, so they they actually developed some um, vaccines in 1918 because they were looking under the microscope and they thought, oh well, we got this, you know, fluid from somebody who died of the flu, and there's some, there's this in it, so maybe that's what caused it. And so then they created this vaccine, and you know, people were given shots and they thought it might help. Right. They didn't know what they were what they were uh, doing, but uh, that's incredible. And, that's and, amazing. Uh, it's just in yeah. hundred years, how the mm -hmm. world has changed. You know, three times over when you think about it. And, uh, Do we have any? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that it was uh, you know the desperation you can imagine. Uh, you know, people yeah. are getting sick and dying all mm -hmm. around you. They were willing to try anything. Try anything okay. and all kinds yeah. of crazy cocktails, if I remember correctly. Yes. Stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 That, I yeah, mean, right. the, the ads that that I found. At Booth, actually, I don't, I'm sure you have them up there we have somewhere. Some of them in the, one of these. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just yeah. absolutely fascinating information and just bizarre well, stuff that you never would imagine being a thing. You well, know what I mean? Rules this is back all, then yeah, 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 I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. It's all pre Food and Drug Administration, so yeah. they, I mean, they could still legally put uh, formaldehyde in milk at this point, so. <laughs> Oh, wow. We're going to have to make sure we vet the library now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody in Matt Charleston is now not eating lunch. You know that. Okay. Um, so many ways to go on this, but it, and I'm going to put you on the spot again, David. I apologize if you don't know. What about locally, like maybe in the Coles County, central part of the country hey, um, era? Uh, do you know how many people passed away around here? Is any, any, any numbers um, on that? We did. Well, Stacy did some research we, on that. We tried to get some of that. It's, um, it's rather difficult because the death register from that time is all handwritten and at the beginning of the epidemic they weren't completely sure what was causing things so okay. um, in the interest of not completely torturing our Illinois Regional Depository Archives intern I just had him pull a few illustrative examples of death certificates rather than try to make okay. him pull every single death certificate but we do have in one of our but cases it, well, there were cases in oh this yeah area. there were yeah. many people okay. in in the area and we've pulled out um like i said probably 10 or so of the death certificates and have them on display where people can look and see okay my follow-up question is is kind of related now that it's 2018 do you as a library when you when you go back and you see the stuff that was archived and documented way back then feel like you have an obligation to make sure that you're archiving and documenting stuff that's going on in our world now so for a hundred years from now when people think what was going on at eastern in 2018 as you pay it forward is that something you think about in your everyday life or do you kind of i mean anybody can answer but uh, um, instinctively, I would say absolutely, and, and not just to, to find those parallels, but you can see some of the parallels. In, in some cases, some of the hysteria or just the way that yeah. preliminarily people react to some of these phenomena. And, and recently, we've had some health scares in which people have reacted very similarly, and you can see those patterns, mm -hmm. but more just to document that general history. So you look back and you can say, well, we have a record of, of what happened, and here's its effect on our, on our local community and, and the general generally the area. And that, that's one of the things that we, we always try to make sure that we work closely with the uh, journalism department over here to get copies of the Daily Eastern News electronically and in print to make sure that uh, we have those available because of course our 1918 paper was extremely brittle and we had to very carefully digitize that to get it to where we could look through it because it was all held together by tape and oh, wow. so you know we're, we're working carefully to make sure that all of that does get saved so that next time people need to look it, it is available. It'll be a little easier I think. A little, hopefully <laughs> a little easier we at least won't have to you know piece it all back together in Photoshop it'll be all in one file. And, and I would <laughs> add those at the flu exhibit it's 1918 to 2018 and recently we've we've had scares with the avian flu the Mm -hmm. swine flu and, yeah. and, and, and you know even stuff like Ebola comes to mind even though it's in a, a, a different a different virus altogether but I mean I'm recalling those as we as we think about documenting that as, mm -hmm. as part of our historical obligation is there talk about the, the, the current flu shot and how most people think they should get a flu shot in, in the exhibit yeah um, we've, we've tried to cover that I uh, provide some information in the set of three cases that's by the stairs on uh, productivity loss from the flu kind of the economic impact of the flu every year um, the number of deaths and illnesses and the easy 
easiest way to prevent all of that is for everyone to just get a flu shot. And uh, the flu shot clinic this year at Eastern is on October 23rd from 10 to 4. It's free for students, free for employees, faculty. So I highly encourage everyone at EIU to come out that day and get their flu shot. Um, for those of you listening that aren't at EIU, you should be able to get one from your doctor or from your pharmacy. That's the best way to prevent something terrible from happening is just everybody get that shot. Make sure Beth sends us another press release on that as we get closer to that date for news, if you would, please. And, well, one, of the, and one of the side notes <laughs> I'd add to that, too, is that a lot of people, I think, are a little unclear on what constitutes the flu. So they might think they have yeah. a common cold. But and, and it was interesting to hear Dr. Sheila Simons talk about that because I was thinking back and, and reflecting, and I thought, I don't think I've ever had the flu that I can recall, not in the way that we, that she would describe it, which mm -hmm. is, you know, being hung up for days and, and yeah. immobile and so. High fever, right. racking yeah. right. cough. Right. Right. Well, it's like last, last year, right? Yeah, they the, the they're, they're, yeah. Or the but wrong influenza shot for the right, the strain. Yeah, well, they or whatever. guess the strain because yeah. they yeah. have to do it about a year in advance and it takes about six months to get up to production and they really don't know what strain is going to be active when they start working on it and it's a gamble and mm -hmm. that's what scares me about what you said about 28 1918 it's still it's still a gamble in 2018 even though we've progressed oh, yeah it, we haven't it progressed absolutely that far. is it's we're only a few mutations away from seeing 1918 again yeah. and that's the scariest thing about and it. the paranoia too still remains the same you know when something you mentioned ebola you know yeah. that that was a huge no, uh, yeah. scare for and everyone and, and that doesn't help airborne from what i understand that's a direct body fluid contact right. Right. Well, no, but it's, it's the <laughs> idea so. that when people think that something oh, bad is going to happen mm -hmm. that makes things so much worse yeah, than yeah, what like they really are so get your flu shot <laughs> and wash your hands oh, wash your hands, wash your hands. <laughs> well, we're running out of time so i want to get real quickly to our uh, the new dean of library services uh, in um sack i guess you know when you think about it in, in, in a short answer here what kind of new energy and new life will you bring to eastern slash booth in the future here uh, it's hard to say other than just an excitement. I, I think it's just an energy that not only I have, but I feel among the, the faculty and staff in the library. And I, I feel there's a real appetite for, you know, in the library field, there's always that opportunity to reflect and move forward in, in a way that not only reflects what the university is doing, but the trends in society. And I feel like we're always trying to, to respond to those changes in the library field, especially digitally and in terms of space and, and services to students. And so I feel a real sense of energy and moving forward and, and changing in a meaningful way that reflects how we can best serve students and facilitate student success and also work closely with faculty across campus and also also help in, in engaging the community in meaningful ways. That's great. So that's Zach Neal. He's the new Dean of Library Services. David Bell, reference librarian, and Stacey Knight Davis, reference librarian. The pandemic, the exhibit is open. It goes until... It goes until December 31st, and knowing us, it'll probably linger into the new year as we uh, try to get things changed over for the space The exhibit. space project, which <laughs> WEIU will be involved with, and we'll get to that uh, in the future. Book sale Wednesday, we forgot about. So oh, if yeah. you book sale at the library on Wednesday, mm -hmm. weather permitting, I did see. So if you can catch that out, uh, check that out, please do that. Well, welcome to campus. Thanks for coming Thank in. You. We Thanks. had more to talk about, but we ran out of time. This is a fast show with a, kind of a fascinating. Thanks for having us. So, yep, absolutely, everybody. absolutely. Have a great day, everybody. This is Hit Mix 88.9 and WEIU. We say glass is half full. This is Hit Mix 88.9 WEIU.